the pathophysiology is how it works with the, with the disease processes. So we'll get into the disease processes much later as, as each chapter goes through. But we'll, we'll need to understand how the organ systems work and how the cells work before we, before we get going. I found this video... some time ago over the cell, and uh, so let's take a look at it, because the parts of the cell are important, but not a great deal for this particular class. Later, for you guys, yeah, this, this will play a more important role. I'll point out the areas of importance as far as the cell is concerned, but this gives us a little overview Finally tonight, keeping boredom out of biology. A Harvard biology professor recently was looking for a way to spice up his course and attract more biology majors. His idea? Get one of America's great animators to make a film showing what's going on in everyone's bodies right now. So what are Harvard students seeing these days? Our Robert Krulwich thought you'd be as fascinated as we were. This is what a human cell looks like in a textbook, dull and still. But your cells are alive. They're in constant motion. They should be a movie, says Harvard biology professor Robert Liu. I'm a big movie buff. And so Professor Liu made a movie, an illustrated but scientifically accurate view of what goes on. For example, let's plunge down here and watch what happens when the cell wants to move something from deep inside the cell to the outside. First, proteins are just floating around, and they suddenly come together to build a road. But as you can see, they grow from little subunit, little smaller proteins coming together. And this happens all the time? It's happening all so the, the time. the bones grow where they're needed? Like yes. Like this? Yes, absolutely. And, and now this is a more complex fiber. Oh, it's coming to into be. Exactly. Here it is falling apart. And it does this as required? Yes. So we're going to create highways or bones of the skin. Oh, wait, what is this? Yes, now this, <laughs> this is a protein called a motor protein. This is a real. Now, right? it is real. That's walking along one of those microtubules. This clumpy thing? Yes. What, it, it, what it is dragging that huge sac? So it's dragging this membrane sac full of proteins. This is the stuff we want to get out of the cell. Now, how does it know what direction to go? I, why, if I told it, turn around, would it be able to? It can't, because the foot only fits in one direction going one way. So the grooves are preset to go in one particular yes. direction? Yes. And how many of these roads are being built every, you know, second? Oh, thousands. I mean, there are thousands of these fibers, if not tens of thousands, in every cell. And also... In your cell, right now, right now, as you're looking, all the time. Right. And they're being built, and they're being broken down. And this is typical cell behavior. Nothing special. There's the cargo being dumped out of the cell. So there you are sitting watching this on TV and you're thinking, well, I'm pretty much doing nothing. But your 72 trillion cells are a riot of magic, elegant, exquisitely organized activity in you right now. Robert Golich, ABC News, New York. Makes you want to go back and take biology. That is World News for this Tuesday. I'm Charlie Gibson and I hope you had a good day. For all of us at ABC News, have a good day. Now, there's a full-length version of that. It's, I think it was 45 minutes or so where this guy shows all these cells. It's pretty cool. I watched it, but I can't find it anymore. So the, we sort of stuck with the short version for, for time. But now the, uh, the boring part. Whoops. Didn't want to do that. Transportation is facilitated by the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. 
which forms an interconnected highway system on which molecules can move from one part of the cell to another. In electron micrographs, the ER appears as loose strings running throughout the cytoplasm. These structures are actually delicate membranes of sacs and tunnels. There are two different types of ER. One type, called rough endoplasmic reticulum, appears to be covered with tiny spheres. Rough endoplasmic reticulum extends from the nucleus and is indeed covered with small structures called ribosomes, which are responsible for the rough appearance. The rough ER connects to the nucleus and is important in transporting certain substances, such as proteins, into and out of the nucleus. Cells that produce large numbers of proteins have more rough ER than those that produce fewer proteins. In addition to providing a surface area for ribosomes, rough ER serves as a storage area for newly synthesized molecules. Another type called smooth endoplasmic reticulum has no ribosomes attached to its surface and thus appears much smoother than rough ER. Like rough ER, Smooth endoplasmic reticulum serves as a storage area, mainly for proteins that will later be exported out of the cell. Ribosomes are the most numerous structures in the cell that may or may not be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes, which are composed of RNA and proteins, are the primary site of protein synthesis. Since all living things rely on proteins for cell maintenance and growth, it is easy to understand why ribosomes are so abundant. The location of ribosomes within a cell provides an indication as to their specific functions. Those located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum synthesize proteins that will eventually be used in the cell's plasma membrane or exported out of the cell. Ribosomes that float freely in the cytoplasm synthesize proteins that will be used inside the cell. Every eukaryotic cell has a uniquely shaped organelle called the Golgi apparatus. Here you see the structure of the Golgi apparatus, which appears as flattened sacs stacked on top of each other. The Golgi apparatus sorts, processes, packages, and delivers proteins and lipids throughout the cell. The proteins and lipids may remain inside the cell, be used in the plasma membrane, or be exported outside the cell. Thus, cells that produce high quantities of proteins and lipids have a very extensive Golgi apparatus. Lysosomes are membrane-enclosed vesicles that form in the Golgi apparatus. They may contain over 40 different powerful enzymes that enable the cell to digest and destroy large molecules. Lysosomes help white blood cells destroy foreign substances such as viruses and bacteria that invade the body. Lysosomes also recycle older or damaged organelles. By engulfing selected organelles and digesting them with powerful enzymes, lysosomes are membrane-bound vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. The hydrolytic enzymes degrade proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates, and are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum. These enzymes are then transported to the Golgi apparatus by transport vesicles. The lysosomes arise from the Golgi apparatus. When particles such as viruses or bacteria are ingested by phagocytosis, the lysosome fuses with the particle containing vesicle, called a phagosome, and delivers the hydrolytic enzymes. Lysosomes also fuse with organelles such as old mitochondria. This results in the destruction and recycling of these structures. You may have heard the mitochondrion referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. This important organelle generates energy in the form of ATP to keep the cell alive. Some cells may have one large mitochondrion. More often, however, cells contain hundreds or even thousands of mitochondria. Cells that require more energy, for example, kidney, liver, and muscle cells, have many more mitochondria than cells that require less energy.
structurally, mitochondria vary in size and shape. However, all mitochondria have two membranes, an outer membrane, which is smooth, and an inner membrane, which is arranged in a series of internal folds called Christi. The many folds of Christi provide an enormous surface area where vital chemical reactions occur. This chemical activity in turn provides energy for the cell. Mitochondria are semi-autonomous, that is, they can grow and self-replicate within the cell. Each mitochondria contains its own ribosomes and a small amount of DNA. Interestingly, mitochondria resemble bacteria in size and biochemistry. And some scientists believe that eukaryotic mitochondria evolved from ancient bacteria. The good part about that. The good part about that, that covered, oh, I don't know, 10 pages or so of that chapter for me that I don't really have to regurgitate. And the good part for you is we don't really get that deep into the cell. I mean, they just want you to know the bits and pieces and, and the parts that we will talk about that's important in the cell we'll, we'll go into when we get into those chapters. That's not necessarily information that you need to stick with right now. Uh, uh, we're going to go, mainly in this class, we focus on organ systems. So that's, that's the good part. We don't get really down to that cellular level. A lot like we did last year, we, we sort of jumped off the deep end on that sometimes. But all this stuff you will see in Anatomy and Physiology 1. So when you take Anatomy and Physiology 1 to get ready for your, you know, your nursing pre -reqs or whatever, Blame that teacher, don't blame me. So we'll just sort of skip over and, and sort of pick and choose what we want to talk about in here. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with getting nutrients in and out of the cells. In, in the EMT portion of it, we concentrate mainly on oxygen, and glucose, and sort of large uh, topics like that. We don't really get into the smaller topics as far as the cell. I don't anticipate, you know, you're not going to get a question on this cell. So the, uh, don't, don't think, oh, I've got to regurgitate all that stuff in the cell. As we go through the class, you'll see that sort of, we'll, we'll have flashbacks and we're we'll sort of go through that uh, bits and pieces of what we need. Right. We do need to know ATP in the mitochondria where it says that's sort of the powerhouse of the cell. That's where glucose is uh, sort of converted into ATP. The food and the carbohydrates we eat and the sugars we take in, all that, it goes into that part of the cell and uh, is converted over eventually into ATP through the citric acid cycle and the peruvic acid cycle or the peruvic acid. Did we talk about that in last year? Maybe during diabetes, maybe we maybe watched a con video or something. Did we do that? We did a Yeah, we did. We just talked a little bit about the Krebs cycle. Once we get back into diabetes, we'll talk a little bit more about the Krebs cycle. It's important as far as that disease process is concerned. But here, we just mainly need to know that in in the mitochondria of the cell, that's where glucose is converted through this process into ATP. That's what we use for fuel, is adenosine triphosphate for the fuel. Without this, the cells themselves, they can't live. So it's like a car, you know, it's the gas for the, for the car. In that sense, the cell has to have it to function. Also, it has to have water. I mean, we know that we should drink, you know, quite a bit of water they say eight ounces, but that's not really enough. Eight glasses. I would say most people, because we drink so much caffeinated stuff and sugar, we, we probably need to at least between one and two liters of water a day. I try to drink almost three liters of water per day. The cells are bathed in water. We're, what, 70% water, right? Some, somewhere along in there. 
So the cells have to have this water in it. If not, like it says, they get dehydrated and they start to shrink. The cells start to shrink. Or we get some sort of backup system in the cell and then they get too big and then they start to destruct because they don't work. Uh, they get too big or they don't work properly. Uh, so water and electrolytes, as far as keeping that homeostasis, what's homeostasis mean? Balance. Balance, right. Body has to stay balanced. So water is very important as far as the cell is concerned to stay balanced. In the EMT part of this, we focus the majority of our effort on oxygen. Oxygen in the cell. Cells need oxygen nonstop all the time. All right. When you look at here, you have two different types. Aerobic metabolism, that's normal. That's when the cell is using the oxygen. Anaerobic metabolism is, is not normal. It's burning up. It's not using oxygen. Usually when we enter into an anaerobic metabolism, we don't have enough oxygen for some reason. We're lacking oxygen or we're lacking red blood cells. And what happens here is once we enter this aerobic metabolism, we start building up acidity, primarily pyruvic acid. That's the same way, you know, in sports, right? You're running along, you're playing your sport, whatever it may be, and your, your muscles get tight, right? Because they don't have enough oxygen to them. Your muscles would never tire if they were just, uh, if you could supply enough oxygen and nutrients to it. So, we build up this pyruvic acid, and that's what makes us sore. You know, after a good workout or something, we build up that acid, it makes us sore, uh, because we entered into an anaerobic metabolism. So we need oxygen, oxygen's important, that's going to be the primary thing uh, we talk about as far as the cell. And then the next thing is glucose. That's just sort of a picture of how the pyruvic acid cycle gets in. And pyruvic acid is, is normal. That's part of the system. Going from glucose, you have a, one glucose cell, and then you enter into this pyruvic acid cycle, and it splits into two. So you have two pyruvic uh, sides to that. What's not normal is the lactic acid. This is what gets in the muscles and makes your muscles so sore for such a long period of time. So, and this happens when we enter into a, an anaerobic metabolism. So if we have plenty of oxygen, we won't be so sore? Yeah. Oxygen and water don't get sore. The main part about that is uh, the lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen, you start burning that pyruvic acid cycle. You get into that, which is normal, then, but then you start building lactic acid along with that. Then we look at the cell membrane of the wall, and as we saw in the video, you know, the cell membrane, things attack the cell membrane wall. Sometimes... Uh, when you look at it in a, in a pictorial reference, the cell membrane has little holes in it where things can, of certain size can enter in and out, mainly fluid, but with fluid comes other things, uh, and it also allows toxins in. That's the way that the hand gel works on the germs. It breaks down this membrane wall and allows the, uh, the chemical in the hand gel to enter and kill the germs on your hands. So the membrane wall is just a protector. It helps protect the cell and it's also responsible for transferring fluid in and out as well. So, I mean there's some stuff in there that's important but it's good reading as far as just reading over the function of the cell. Like I said, we are mainly uh, focus more in on systems. So let's look at this cardiovascular system. Start out with the respiratory system. There shouldn't be any doubt why it's called the bronchial tree, right? You flip it up the other way, it looks like a tree. This happens to be the lower airway. 
We know that the upper airway consists of the nose and the mouth and the pharynx. In the lower airway, it starts at the larynx. The larynx is where the vocal cords are. It moves down to the trachea. Keep in mind the trachea has the C-shaped uh, cartilage in it to hold it upright. The esophagus, which is posterior, is flattened. So it doesn't have the cartilage. It comes down somewhere around 21 centimeters. It's the uh, average trachea. It bifurcates at the carina, this point right here in the trachea. And then it goes to the left and uh, right bronchus. You notice the left primary bronchus is longer and at a different angle, and this one's shorter. At the end of the class, when we talk about intubation, you, when you intubate, when you put the breathing tube in there, if you go too deep, it has the tendency to go into the right bronchus because it's shorter and it's easier to go. This one won't it won't go in there as easy. But if you put the tube in too far, it has the tendency to go into the to the right bronchus. Then it just breaks down from these the bronchus into bronchioles and then smaller and smaller bronchioles. And they get in, you know, you get this tissuary bronchial and, and all this. And if you want to make a side note, this bronchus right here is where oxygen exchange really starts taking place a little. But primarily, we know the oxygen exchange takes place where? Yeah, the alveolus. At the terminal end of, of the bronchial. So and that's what we're looking at there. Is it comes down, it comes into these grape stripe type, okay, let me stroke. Grape type looking structures here. Uh, always picture the alveolus like a, a cluster of grapes. You hold it up and you have the stems going into the grape, the stems would be the, the bronchial, then you go into that cluster and how they're all clustered together. But we have to remember for gas exchange purposes, this is a respiratory or a pulmonary capillaries, right? And these capillaries essentially lay all over those, those alveolus. They lay on top. The alveolus is a very thin walled structure and the capillaries are very, very thin walled, so that gas exchange is able to take place. I, I picture it like if you stick with the grape analogy, picture you have this cluster of grapes and then you have a couple of spiders spinning webs all over the grapes. And that's what this would probably look like with these cluster of capillaries, the venous side and arterial side of this capillary going over the alveolus for to get diffusion or oxygen exchange. Alright, because everybody's familiar with diffusion, right? Respiratory, you, the air enters the body, goes into the bronchioles, ends up in the alveolus. It's high in concentration, oxygen concentration, and you know the cardiovascular system is pumping the blood back to the lungs to be reoxygenated. So because of that difference in pressure, remember gas always moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if we go back here and we look at this alveolus, when I just took that breath, it filled the alveolus with air, so there's a high concentration of oxygen in the alveolus, and there's a low concentration of oxygen in this, these venous capillaries. So as that blood passes over that alveolus, the oxygen is going to be transported into the, into the capillary system to take it to the, back to the heart and to the rest of the body. And then there's a high concentration of carbon dioxide in this capillary uh, system and a low concentration of oxygen in the alveolus. Then that gas, the CO2, it's going to diffuse back across into the alveolus and then we exhale it out. It's the basic way that that works. Everybody remember that? I remember that through gas exchange. Nobody shaking their head, but does anybody care? Okay, that's, that's probably the most important answer. So let's look at the airway. Uh, as we know, ABCs, you have to have an open airway open airway or patent airway, 
That's the medical term for have to have an open, something open, it's patent. I just say open, don't really like the word patent, but open airway. We get through different obstructions, you get blood and trauma and vomitus and everything else that could potentially create an airway obstruction. That's what's coming up next class, is airway management, where we'll talk about those airway obstruction. But primarily, and always, we want to make sure that the patent patient has an open airway. It has an open airway because we're able to get air from the atmosphere into the lungs. Now, taking air from the atmosphere through the mouth, down the trachea, to the lungs, to the point of the alveolus is called what? There's a word for that. Taking atmospheric air in into the lungs is called what? Start, huh? Starts with an R. Respiration. Taking air from the alveolus into the bloodstream is called what? That's the process how it works. The, the term. Starts with a V. Ventilation. Right. So you have respiration of taking air out here into the lungs and then ventilation from the, the essentially the lungs to the bloodstream. Now it does work through the process of diffusion, you're right, but it's called ventilation. When we look at this, so we've taken this amount of air in, we get this term called tidal volume. And just like it says, it's the amount of air that you breathe in during each inspiration. The average tidal volume for an adult is what? Huh? 500 milliliters. So the average adult tidal volume is 500 milliliters and we compare that to the bag valve mass which is what? Every time I squeeze the bag it's about 500 milliliters, right? So a 500 milliliter bag equals out with a 500 milliliter tidal volume. When we take the tidal volume and with the respiratory rate, then we get the minute volume. And that's just the amount of air that moves in and out of lungs every minute. Not a great deal of concern there. It's just a def another definition sort of to hang on to. But the main thing, when we start talking about respiratory emergencies, is this tidal volume. Are they able to inhale a normal tidal volume for that patient? Or are they breathing shallow for some reason? Maybe like in trauma they have a rib injury where they can't get a deep breath. So they're not getting enough air into the lungs which equates to what? Right. Lack of oxygen. So if you're not getting enough air in on the other side of that, you're not going to get enough oxygen to the tissue. And that's, that's all the respiratory emergencies there. That's why we have to learn this in order, to, like when we get into asthma and COPD, and all the COPDs and CHF and all that, that we understand how this works so we can fix it. Because that's what you guys will be doing. You'll be giving medications to help try to fix it. So any change in the tidal volume reduces the minute volume, but we think about it as oxygen. It reduces the amount of oxygen that the blood can, I mean, that the body's taking in. Keep in mind there's two different ways the respiratory center is controlled. It is controlled by the medulla oblongata. Remember water boy? It's probably getting too old now with a movie, but don't, you know you have to go back into the oldies on Netflix and watch the Water Boy. But it's controlled by the medulla, which is on the brain set, uh, stem, and in the brain stem you have an area called the pons, P-O-N-S, and on the pons there's a inspiratory center and an expiratory center. They have names. I I'd have to go look at my cheat sheet. Abnustic and something else, but there's an inspiratory center and a 
expiratory center on the pons in the medulla that controls the respiratory rate. People with normal breathing breathe on what drive? People who are breathing normal, like me and you, because you're not a smoker, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. What about today? I mean, have packed this morning. <laughs> we breathe on what drive? A response to what? I don't understand the question. Like when I take a breath, go. I'm breathing on a response to what in the body? Change oxygen. I don't understand. Huh? Yeah. 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 Oxygen, with the amount of carbon dioxide, the body recognizes, it's like, hey, too much carbon dioxide, so I'm going to take a breath. So the medulla sends in the inspiratory center, sends a signal down to the diaphragm, the di diaphragm to contract, and the diaphragm contracts in a downward motion, right? And then it sends a signal to the rib cage. The intercostal muscles, the muscles in between the ribs. So the diaphragm contracts, the intercostal muscles force the uh, thoracic cavity outward, which does what to the thoracic cavity? Right, expands it. So what happens to the pressure in the thoracic cavity? Right, it decreases. So the diaphragm contracts. The thoracic cavity comes outward. It makes the cavity larger or increases the size of the cavity and it decreases the pressure. It decreases the pressure less than atmospheric pressure. So the chest wall gets expands enough where it's less than atmospheric pressure. Now you have a higher atmospheric pressure than an intra, intra inside, right? Intrathoracic pressure. So what's going to happen? Right, airs don't come in. And it's not a great deal. Let's say you have this guy here. That would be his chest wall. And the pressure is, I don't know, 7. Atmospheric pressure is 760. So you have 7. 58 here because you, you took the diaphragm contracted and the thoracic cavity got bigger, right? So it dropped it down two millimeters of mercury. So the air, air will always move from a level of high concentration to a level of low concentration. So air is going to go in, right? It's going to fill the chest wall to what? 760. 760, it's going to equalize or, or close to that. Now air doesn't move anywhere, right? It's equal, it can't move. So what happens is the, the respiratory center of the brain says, okay, got enough. So the, it's going to allow the diaphragm to relax, come back up, uh, allow the intercostal muscles to relax, and the chest wall is going to return to its normal shape, which is going to drive this pressure up to 763, hypothetical, right? And so now, the pressure inside the chest wall is greater than the atmospheric pressure, so it's going to exhale. Does everybody remember that? So the, uh, you have... You have to change the two pressures back and forth in order to inhale and exhale. How does it increase whenever the diaphragm relaxes? Yes. The di I'll probably cut that short. The diaphragm relaxes and the intercostal muscles relax. So the thorax goes back to its original size. See, it was expanded, correct? And now it goes back to its original size. 
which increases the pressure in the thorax. And once the pressure becomes, in the thorax, becomes greater than the atmospheric pressure, then we exhale. And that happens all the time. 12 to 20 times per minute is the normal respiratory rate. So that happens 12 to 20 times per minute all the time. Off of the response to CO2. We, uh, we breathe normally on the response to carbon dioxide. So this takes place and this gas starts moving back and forth due to these pressure changes in the thoracic cavity. Once we get into the different medical emergencies, then we'll see that saying, well, either the pressure is too high or too low, it didn't change, or they're not getting adequate tidal volume. There's a number of reasons why uh, you have these different respiratory dysfunctions. Like it says here, infection, the drugs, trauma, a, a laundry list of things could disrupt the respiratory control. The other thing that can disrupt it is the, is the pressure. Disruption in pressure. And what I mean by that is where you get what's called a pneumothorax. Pneumo would be air. Uh, we would know it more as a collapsed lung. So what happens is do the punctures in the lungs or uh, smokers get these uh, new, simple pneumothoraxes. In trauma, you would get a tension pneumothorax. But e either way, this air is now entering into this space. And there's a disruption of the pressure. Take that homeostasis out of the way. We'll learn a lot about pneumothoraxes later. We just need to know for now that pressure disruptions on the... Uh, visceral, the covering of the lungs and the covering of the thoracic cavity, uh, you can get a hole in that, essentially, and cause pressure disruptions. It's almost like you have two filled up balloons here, and you poke a hole in one balloon, a slow leak, and it starts to shrink and shrink. This balloon over here is still the same size, right? But this balloon starts to shrink, and, that, and it starts to collapse. And that's like whenever someone was, gets stabbed or something? Yeah, stabbed or shot or you could get it through blunt force trauma. You could get hit with something, a steering wheel, a bat. Uh, Don't that happen like when it's like a lot of times like when you crack your ribs? And like, yeah, you, yeah, crack rib can puncture the lung as well. So there's, there's a lot of different things that could uh, cause this to happen. And that's what we'll look at in trauma. We'll look at, uh, did, we suck, did we look at that sucking chest wound film last year? Must not have got to that. But anyway, that's, we'll, we'll look at these different things that causes the disruption of pressure. And then, of course, problems to the lung tissue itself. If with like in trauma... You could get a, a bruise, a contusion, a pulmonary contusion in there where there's blood in there. CHF, there could be fluid, which, which all results in, a, it sort of messes up the oxygen and carbon dioxide level. So, low oxygen level, or hypoxia, H-O, hypo, meaning low, right? And then when you see this, X-I-A, uh, suffix that's a that would be something with breathing so low tissue or low oxygen to the cells is hypoxia hypercarbia is high carbon dioxide so it, it's a it's a finely tuned system as far as we keep the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide water and salts all right? And then as we compensate, as the body compensates, we start breathing faster or slower. Depends on what, the, what it needs to compensate for, whether oxygen or carbon dioxide. If we're retaining too much carbon dioxide for some reason, 
then the body will start breathing faster to get rid of the carbon dioxide. If we don't have enough carbon dioxide, the body will start breathing slower to, to retain carbon dioxide. You have to have that balance in there that uh, keeps the normal carbon dioxide level is 35 to 45. So the body recognizes that through different chemoreceptors and it's able to adjust it through the respiratory rate, primarily through the respiratory rate. All right, any questions over the cell in the, in the respiratory rate? Is everybody good there? I mean, it's a quick overview, but what we'll look at later is just we'll pick up the different, we have a whole chapter over respiratory emergencies.